why are we here? What is so big? What is the big deal about Easter? Why do we get all dressed up so pretty? Why do we wear our melon shirts like Timmy's got on, you know? Why do we do that, you know? It's because of something great happened all this weekend back 2,000 years ago. Guys, we needed a Savior. We couldn't do it ourselves. We couldn't be good enough. We couldn't do enough good things. We couldn't pay enough money. We needed someone to restore us back to God. And there was only one that was worthy to do that. And he was the beloved son of Jesus Christ. He was this beloved son of God, Jesus Christ. And guys, as we look at this today, in this first verse, Russell's not up there. But I want, to, I want us to read what happened, and then I want us to go back and see why that's so exciting. But let me just read from the Bible. It's not on the screen or anything. Just listen. I'm over in Luke 24. Very familiar scriptures. But the thing I want us to be aware of, guys, is that we don't hear the Easter story so often that it becomes old hat to us. That it's just another story that, yeah, that was cool and that was great and God did some big things there. But, guys, we need to understand that if this doesn't happen, we have no promise of heaven. We have no promise of a glad reunion with our relatives someday. We have no promise of seeing Jesus with our own eyes. Because of what happened this weekend 2,000 years ago, we have a promise, guys, that is real, that you can count on, that will happen that is happening, and Jesus makes it available to everybody. And I want you to know today that salvation is near. We talked about that last week, and, and I don't know if we understand how close it is. You may be in this room, and you've never given your heart to Jesus. You've never thought about that. You've never, you, maybe you don't think you're worthy enough. Maybe you don't think you're good enough. And, and guys, none of us are. None of us are, amen? None of us are. But because of Jesus coming and doing the wonderful work of the cross, and, and, you know, that was great. And we're going to talk about that probably more this morning than we are the resurrection. But that was great. But, you know, a lot of great people have come and did great things. And a lot of people have come and done great things and died. But they never come back out of the grave. And what made Jesus different, first of all, he was fully God and fully man. Second of all, he was the son of God. Next of all, he was perfect in every way. And he could pay the price for our sins. But then his father raised him up out of the grave on the third day to show that what my son has done is perfect. And now you can, there's been a way made. There's been a bridge built back to heaven that you can come across that bridge, and that bridge is through my son, Jesus Christ. John 14 says, and I probably say it every sermon I preach, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. And guys, that's not narrow-minded. That just lets you know the right way to go. You don't have to guess. You don't have to guess how to get to heaven. There is a way. It's through Jesus. It's the only way. But I'd love to know the only way. I don't want to know a way or maybe it'll get you there or I hope it'll get you there through Jesus Christ. And what he did on this cross and when he come out of that grave on that third day, we can have a one way to the Father that is perfect in every way. And I thank you for that so much. Listen to this on that Sunday morning. Listen to what happened. On the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. This would be a good point to say amen, all right? Amen. They didn't find his body. While they were there wondering about, wondering about this, what in the world's going on? Can you, I asked my class this morning, can you imagine what they were thinking? Put yourself in that place. What in the world's going on here? While they were there wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. An angel showed up of all things, a couple of them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, listen to this, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's alive. He's alive. He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you? While he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. He's alive. He's alive. He's not here. 
He kept his promise. He did it for you. He said he was coming for you, and he did it. And all you have to do is trust him and accept that promise. And he can change your life. Let's pray just a minute. Lord, help us this morning to portray this in a way that will speak to people's hearts. Help them see you, Lord, more clear than they've ever seen you in their life. And Lord, may we all leave here thinking how, how blessed we are to have a God that loves us like this. Lord, it's not just something we do on Easter. Lord, it's not just something that we get together for an event. Lord, this is something that changed the course of human history. Lord, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Help us to realize that this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Over in John it says this, and then I'm going to get the scriptures on the screen. So the soldiers took Jesus, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Crucifixion was the most excruciating form of death in all of human history. And we thought about this this morning in our class. You know, Jesus could have come when they could have just beheaded him. Jesus could have come and they could have just shot him. They could have come and they could have put arrows in him. But God sent to, sent to choose his son at a time in human history when they were using the most excruciating form of death and torture could ever be imagined. In most cases, you would carry the wood part. This part here, you would carry on your back. And they would have you carry that through the streets, just as we read the story about Jesus. It was meant to be so humiliating and so degrading, and it was meant to be a form of repelling others from doing wrong. And they would do it in front of everybody. They would take all your clothes off. Sometimes they might leave you a loincloth most of the time, they just hung you up there naked. And guys, I want you to understand as I tell you this, this was happening to the perfect son of God. This was happening to a man that never done anything wrong. This was a man that was going to be humiliated because of you and me. And they would lay him down on the ground and lay him on the cross member, and they would drive a nail through this and, and attach the cross beam, and then they would put nails through his hands. And usually there was a little seat right here on the cross. And then they would put you and they would support your whole weight by a nail through your feet. And what you would do is you'd be hanging there and then you'd just kind of push up and get some air and slump back down on that seat. And that seat wasn't there to make it comfortable for you. That seat was there to prolong your death. It was to make it worse. It was to make it more excruciating. And he would raise up and get a breath. <gasps> And, and slump back down. And as they stuck that cross in the hole and raised him up, and you imagine it, if you ever put fence posts in the ground, how they get to a certain point, they just fall in. And can you imagine the weight of Jesus as that cross falls into the hole, and he just bounces. And his, the nails rip at his hands, and they rip at his feet. And he's thirsty. He's all alone. And even his father turns his back on him. You know why? Because of us. That was the only time he didn't call him his father. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of a sudden, that connection was broken just for a time. Because all the sin of every mankind for all of time. God poured his wrath out on his son. And for that moment, he left the father and son relationship and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here's the thing we talked about in class. And I know how much everyone in this room loves their kids and their grandkids. And guys, I'm telling you, I would fight a chainsaw for my girls. And you would probably do the same. 
when they get sick, when they hurt themselves, it breaks my heart that I can't make them well immediately. God's only begotten son is hanging on this cross. He's looking at that. And guys, listen to me, don't ever forget this. He had every bit of power he needed to snap his fingers and get his son off that cross. And rather than help his son, he turned his back and heaped all his wrath on him so that me and you could have eternal life. That's a pretty big love. That's a pretty big love. You see, he knows what it's like to lose a child. And he didn't have to lose a child. He gave his child. He knows what that's like. And he could have stopped it at any minute. But guys, if he'd have stopped it, we wouldn't be here today. There wouldn't be an Easter. There wouldn't be salvation. There wouldn't be an all-time champion of love because we wouldn't have needed it. We wouldn't have been able to get back to the Father. We'd have been lost eternally. The precious blood of Jesus changed our life. It changed our history. And God gave up his only begotten son so that me and you could find our way back to him. So me and you could someday be reunited with family that trusted him. So me and you could be someday reunited in a place that has no pain, no sickness, no death, no turmoil, turmoil, no more hurt, no more lying, no more cheating, no more nothing but perfection. And he did it so someday we can stand face to face and see our Savior. What a day that will be. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The Bible is a bloody book. And we don't like to talk about the blood of Jesus much. We like to talk about the happy things. We like to talk about the love he has. And he, guys, if you can't see love in the blood, you're not looking close enough. But the Bible is a bloody book. And the blood has all come from sin. All the way back in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve had everything they needed. And they chose their own way, and they chose to sin against God. And the very first thing he had to do was kill an animal and make them, make them some clothes. And the bloodbath began. All throughout the Old Testament, you see the bloodbath continue. Cain kills Abel. Noah gets off the ark, and God says, take and eat. Now you can kill the animals. And they begin to kill and to eat. And, and that, that relationship between man and nature was broken. And the Bible says it groans to be made right. Then you see Abraham take his son Isaac to the top of the mountain, and he's about to sacrifice his son, and God says, stop, that's enough. But over in the, over in the bushes is an innocent ram, and the ram's brought, and it's sacrificed, and the bloodbath continues. You move on through Joseph. His brothers didn't like him. His dad made him a coat of many colors. They killed animals and put it all over the coat, took it back to their dad and said, he's dead. The bloodbath continues. Later on, Moses and the Egyptians and the slavery and the death angels passing over and going to kill all the firstborn and the bloodbath continues. And they're asked to put the blood over their doorposts so their kids will be protected. The bloodbath continues. On through Daniel and his group, on through, and you go all through the minor prophets, and you see time and time again the battles and the bloodbath continues. And then we get to the greatest, most important shedding of blood in all of history. Look with me in Hebrews, next screen. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went to the greater and more perfect tabernacle. That is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not a part of the creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining 
eternal redemption. All through the Old Testament, if you wanted your sins forgiven, you had to bring your animal, the best animal you could raise, your best sheep, your best dove, whatever it was, and the priest, the high priest would crucify it. I mean, he would sacrifice it, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, and your sins were covered for a whole year. And the bloodbath continued on and on for hundreds and hundreds of years, bringing the animals, killing the animals, bringing the animals, killing the animals. And all this was to let us know there's a perfect lamb coming. There's a perfect lamb coming. And then Jesus shows up. And all of a sudden, he didn't need to use goats and calves anymore. He didn't bring a lamb and say, here, crucify this, sacrifice this for everybody. He said, no, I'm bringing my own blood to this one. I'm bringing my own blood. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all. That's the good part right there, guys. He don't have to get up every year and kill himself again on the cross. Every Easter, every Easter, Jesus does not need to crawl back on this cross and be humiliated the Bible says he did it once for all. You don't have to keep giving your heart to Jesus and giving your heart to Jesus and giving your heart to Jesus. If you give it to him once for all, it's for all of eternity. He holds on to you, and he will never let you go. He will never let you go. The bloodbath continued, but this blood changed things. It didn't just cover the sins. It washed them away. It washed them white as snow. Read on with me. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more than will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Here's what it's saying real easy, guys. If blood and goats, the blood of goats and calves would, would cover our sins for a year, how much more does the blood of the Son of God, how much more can it do than all those things combined? And we look at this, and it cleanses us so that we may serve not a God that died and got put in the grave, but we can serve a living God, a living God. Move on down with us, guys. Go on down. Keep going. Keep going. Let's look at this blood real quick. We're running out of time already. First of all, I want you to know this precious blood of Jesus redeems us. It redeems us. For you know that it was not with the perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Can't buy your way in, guys. Can't pay enough money. Can't do enough good things. As I said earlier, there's only one way you can do this. It's through Jesus. That's why he had to die. That's why he had to shed his blood. Nothing else would work. Nothing else would be accepted by God himself but the only precious blood of his son. His blood redeems us. It buys us back. It purchases us. It puts us in right relationship with God as nothing else ever could or nothing else ever will. The precious blood of Jesus. Number two, his blood brings us into fellowship with God. Next screen, guys. But now in Christ Jesus, you are once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Well, Brother Todd, I just don't think God loves me. I think I've done too many things wrong. I, I, I just think, I think I've failed too many times. I don't think he can forgive me. I think he's, I think I've had maybe five forgivenesses and he'd give me, he done already forgave me all those five times. And so I think I'm out of extra chances. I don't think I've got any second chances left. Listen to me. God did not allow his son to be nailed on this cross so you could run out of chances. He allowed his son to be nailed to this cross so he could draw you near. You ever got a baby that's crying? And you want to just get them really close to you. You want to, you want to draw them near. Where they, the, 
the guys that are really smart say that they can hear the mother's heartbeat and it, it relaxes them and it, it quietens them and it, it comforts them. Jesus wants to draw you so near that you can hear his heartbeat. And he wants to take care of you. He wants to love you like you've never been loved before. He wants to have a fellowship with you. He loves you. Why in the world do you think he would go to this trouble to crucify his own son on a cross if he didn't love you? If he didn't want to forgive you? If he didn't want you to accept him and spend eternity with him in heaven? That's what he wanted to do it for. He loves the fellowship. He loves being with you. And he can wash you white as snow. The next one, his blood makes peace with God. Since the garden, guys, we've been at war with God. And listen to me, you're sitting here today and you've never accepted the precious blood of Jesus Christ and washed your life clean, you're at war with God. And, and I don't mean that in a mean way, but it's just facts. Because the Bible says you're either for him or against him, okay? And so right now, you're at war with God. You're, you can't get close to God because you've not allowed his son to cleanse you, his blood to cleanse you, so that you can come in the presence of a holy God. And so we look at this and we say, how can I get, how can I have that peace? How can I have to be restored? And here Jesus did it for you. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through what? His blood shed on the cross. Can you see over and over the reoccurring theme? There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of Christ. Wonder-working power. It can cause you not to be at war with God anymore. It can, it can put peace in your life. And not only a peace with Christ, but a peace with everyone. Now you say, well, wait, wait a minute, Brother Todd. You don't know some of the people I know. <laughs> They're pretty rough. But you know what? When Jesus saves you, there's a peace in you that you can deal with things better. Not always perfectly, but you can deal with things better. And he gives you that peace. A peace that passes all understanding. A peace that lets you come back in his presence. And he wraps his arm around you. And he says, oh, I love you. Don't you understand how much I love you today? Can you hear him talking to you today, guys? Can you hear him talking to you? You're not here by happenstance. You're not here by accident. You may have thought, I'm just coming with my family. I just want to go be with them, and that's great. I'm so glad you're here. But guys, you're here, and God wants to speak to you. He wants you to know him. And if you know him already, he wants you to know him fuller and more. God was pleased to have all his fullness. Every bit of God was in his son. Every bit of God was in his son. And though, and through him to reconcile himself all things, everyone is welcome back in the family through the blood of Jesus Christ. Please hear that today. Next one, please, guys. His blood washes us clean. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? I love that song. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son, purifies us from all sin. Isn't that great this morning? I can be made right. As mean and ornery and as ugly as Todd Benson can be, I can be made right through the blood of Jesus. You can be made right through the blood of Jesus. It's not about who we are. It's about who he is. Please understand that this morning. We want to make our salvation about what we are and what we can do and what we bring to the table. All we bring to the table when we come to Jesus, guys, is our lostness. All we bring to the table is our need for a Savior. And Jesus says, I got it from here. I got it from here. I'll take it from here. But I don't have to. No, I got it. But, but do I have to do that? No, I got it. But, but what about this? No, I, I got it. Jesus says, I got it. I can take care of it. His son, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us. It washes us. 
It cleanses us from all of our sin. Can, can you just take a moment and wrap your brain around what the blood of Jesus accomplished? Can you, can you wrap your brain around it? It's not about what I've done, but it's about what God has done through Jesus and what Jesus has done on the cross and his spilt precious blood. Next one, guys. Here's the big one. His blood gives us power over the devil. And guys, this is a hard one. But he does give us his power to overcome. All the way in Revelation, the very back of the book, we have took you from generation, Genesis to Revelation in less than 30 minutes. That's a world record, all right? Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser, that's the devil, of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Think about that. And I think that's why we feel like we're dirt and not worthy of God and all the other crud that the, that the devil puts in our mind is because day and night he's going before God and saying, Todd Vincent's no good. Todd Vincent's no good. Todd Vincent's no good. You may think you love him, but you know he's no good. And he's, he hurls insults all day long about you and about me. But you know what God does when he hears that? Todd Vincent's been covered by the blood of my son. It does not matter. It does not matter. When he says your name, yeah, but Gary, Gary Gardner's a sinner. Gary Gardner's a failure. Raymond Carr, he's a failure. Joe Girdley, he's a failure. Yeah, they once were. But they've been cleansed and they've been saved by the blood of my son. And they are righteous before me because of his blood. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Do not sit there this morning and think that you cannot be saved, that you're, it's too late for you because there's a God of grace that's got his arms wide open and says, all that will come, please come, please come, please come and let my son and his blood that was shed for you cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you can stand before me someday, God says, and I will say, welcome in thy good and faithful servant because you've trusted in my only begotten son. And he does that for you and for me. And that's why we're excited. That's why we get all excited on Easter because we serve a risen Savior that changes our lives. And he wants to change your life today. And just let him do it. If you have already, thank him again for it. Thank him again and again and visit this cross every day. When you get feeling down and discouraged and, and wondering if you're no good or whatever, you say, I was worth something because God killed his son on this cross. I'm worth something because he thought so much of me to do that. And you just take him in your arms and embrace him and he will change your life, I promise. I promise he will. I promise he will. Our last screen today says this. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood gives me strength from day to day. It will never, ever lose its power. That's the blood you need this morning. That's, listen, guys, don't you agree the bloodbath is continuing? Have you read the news lately? Somebody's murdering somebody every day. It's because of sin. ISIS is cutting Christians' head off every day. It's because of sin. The bloodbath's going to continue. But the main shedding of blood that had to happen happened 2,000 years ago, and it's changed everything. And one of these days, he's that same God, that same Savior that died on that cross, and I think it's getting close, is going to come back to this earth. He's going to take all the believers home with him forever and ever, and we're going to be with God, and he will be with us. And the bloodbath's going to stop. But then listen to me, guys. There's a lot more blood to be shed. We can have power over the devil. We can have power over him oppressing us. It's not because of me. I'm a great guy. I'm not. It's not because of you, even though you look pretty in your Easter outfits. 
Guys, it's because Jesus Christ shed his blood and the power of Christ that lives in us. We can overcome. We can overcome to the end through the power of Christ, and someday he's going to carry us home. And you know what, my, listen, guys, a lot of people say, well, I just don't like coming to church much. But listen to me. If you don't like this right here, you won't like heaven. Okay? If you don't like this right here, this is people that believe in Christ. This is people that want to know more about God. This is people that have come to worship a risen Savior. This is what heaven's going to be like. Except I'm not going to be preaching, all right? I'm going to be sitting out there and listening to the Lord, okay? But, but listen, this is what it's going to be like, being with God's people. And, and much better, we're going to be sin-free. We're going to love each other completely, and we're not going to have to worry about, I wish you'd hurry up, i got to go meet some family, or i got a job to go to. We're not going to have to worry about that. We can just sit there, and we can worship and do things and walk and be with the Lord day by day, and it's just going to be the most incredible thing ever. And we'll never have to go to a funeral again. We'll never have to go visit a hospital. We'll never have to see kids with cancer and moms with cancer. We'll never have to see that again. Because the one that died on that cross is going to make everything right. And you know what? He's already started doing that. You know, the moment he came back to life, he started setting things right. If you read in there, they found the, the, the head wrap. Back there when you died, they'd wrap your body. But they found the head wrap that was on Jesus' head. They found it folded up and put in place. He was already setting things in place. Jesus didn't stumble out of the grave and somebody take these off me. When he came back to life, guys, he was ready to go. He was ready to go. And he already began folding things up, putting things together. He was already setting things in place so that things could be great for all those that follow the great shepherd. And his name is Jesus Christ. Isn't it a good day to be alive? Isn't it a good day to know Jesus? And guys, listen to me. If you don't know him today, I know this is a great big crowd, and it would probably be the toughest thing in your your life to come down here and give your heart to Jesus today. But I'm going to give you just a moment. I've got guys coming to the sides of these stages right now, and they're going to be here for you. If you'd like to talk to them, Or if you'd like to raise your hand, they'll come back and talk to you. They'll take you to one of these rooms if you don't want to talk out in front of everybody. And if that's way too scary for you, you grab me or one of these guys you see up front after church and say, I've got to talk to you before I leave this place. I didn't realize how much I was loved. I didn't realize that that blood was shed for me. And I want to apply that blood to my life. And I want him him to be my Savior Please don't leave these walls today. And don't start another hour of this Easter, Easter Sunday without Jesus Christ. It will be the greatest single decision of your life. Would you say amen to that church? Would you applaud our Savior today? Amen. I love you. I love you for being here today. But God loves you so much more than that. Let's pray together. Dear Father, as we come today, Lord, we're overwhelmed by what you've done. And Lord, the power that's in your blood. Lord, I pray for those that are here today that have already accepted that. I pray that you would strengthen them and just make their their vigor even greater for you, their energy even greater. Encourage them, Lord. Maybe they were feeling down today that they weren't really important. And Lord, they've been shown once again they are important. And Lord, for folks around this room today that maybe have just not quite made that decision yet. Maybe they don't either, they don't understand it or maybe they didn't feel worthy or or whatever it was, Lord. Please just lay on their heart today that you love them and you care for them and you can change their life. And you can give them a home in heaven for all of eternity. Because Lord, there is an alternative and none of it's good. And Lord, you want to save them, you want to rescue them from that. And they can follow you and have a perfect eternity with you someday. Speak to hearts today, Lord, as only you can. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If you have prayer requests, need to contact us, or need directions to the church, check us out online at fbckaiser.com. If you want to join us, we're located at 210 East Main Street. 
or give us a call at 870-526-2604 or send mail to P.O. Box 306, Kaiser, Arkansas, 72351. We'd love to see you soon. Thanks again for joining us, and may God bless you.